Hello and welcome back and it's a Tuesday we've just had the bank holiday Monday a long weekend here in the UK has just gone by um, I've just um, got an order of sticks into a shop I'm actually pretty low on stock so I've got a lot of work to get caught back up on and I have a raft of custom orders and that's uh, what I'm going to talk to you about now because I'm going to take you along on one of the builds in particular and this is going to involve me doing a Y piece on top of uh, a shank or a shaft of uh, hazel. It's completely custom what he wants in no regard traditional to a Y or thumb stick as they're called and I don't really specialise in them but this here is so far removed from the traditional style but what the customer wants, the customer gets. So I'm about to do this. Um, the reason I'm going to take you along on this build is quite simply because in previous videos, I've shown how I attach deer antlers and other heads or toppers on top of uh, sticks. But I've failed to show the part where I'm actually using the epoxy. I just put it in and then, well, quite simply, epoxy's messy, it's dirty. If you get it on your camera, get it everywhere, it's, you're either not going to get it off or it's going to be really hard to do so. And filming on my own with just a phone has always been difficult. But I'm going to enroll the help of somebody to video me doing that horrible, nasty, sticky, dirty bit. So, and that will be the two-part epoxy. And that is putting the V-shape onto the shaft. So I'll take you along on that. And that's my specific aim of this video. But for now, I've got to finish racking and then get back into the workshop and start making a plan of action. Well, I'm back in the uh, workshop now. I've drawn a simple Y shape on a piece of iroco, and this is a hardwood. Um, it's quite dark, but the, the thumbstick I'm doing will actually be a camo model. So it's going to be completely covered with a spray job. But I've got to get this simple Y shape out of this piece of wood. I'll do that in a rather crude fashion. I'll show you in a moment. And then from then it'll be rasp and files to get the rough shape that I want. I will attach it to the actual shank and then I'll do my finishing sanding from there. But my main aim now is I've got the shape there or the rough shape. And from here, I'm now going to get it out and start bringing that back down to how I envisage um, I want my Y piece. Yeah, you're not seeing things. I'm bringing a chainsaw to this job. It's a bit like bringing a Challenger to tank to a squirrel hunt when a catapult and steel shot would do. But there you go. I'm going to get this done pretty quick. <laughs> Oh, 
well well guys i've got a rough shape there now and from here it'll all be hand sanding quite simply because i don't have the intricate tools so i've got the rough shape that's taken a fair bit of time away from me so yeah hand sanding here i go so uh pointless you watching me do this because it's going to be a little while Well, we're back in the workshop and not uh, before time started to rain and we've left all the muck and mess out there so we don't have to bring it in here. Now, we've done a reasonable job to this. I've polished it up to not a bad standard and um, I think it wouldn't take too much more if you wanted to actually sit this on a shank and have this come up like it would do with the natural grain and the colourings. We won't be going too far with the polishing of this because quite simply it's going to have a paint job on top and then polyurethane. That's what the customer wants, so he wants it a camel model, so we'll be doing that. Now, I've got a number 20 here uh, hole driller and that's going to be drilling out here. If you look at that, it chamfers down into the Y piece. If you can see, basically it's fatter down here and it gets thinner as it goes up. My concern was to make sure I've always got enough I can drill out and still not destroy the walls of the hole as in coming through the actual uh, Y piece. So try to keep it intact. And I've just had a look, and yes, I do believe that if you have a look there, I've got enough there. I can go up through, leaving enough meat on those walls to be of a real sturdy, you know, fixing on top of the shank. And because it's a number 20, I'm going to have a very nice substantial peg. It's going to be thicker than my thumb going up in here so it's going nowhere so i'm quite happy with that i'm going to grab a cup of coffee and some dinner and um, proceed on afterwards so i've actually got the um, y piece in my vice and i've got it protected by some rubber um, protectors so the so we don't bite into the wood and cause any damage which i'd have to sand out now I'm just going to try and find the best I can, the centre for this, um, for, for where I'm going to drill. I want to give myself the best chance. So what I'm doing, I'm roughly trying to do a cross, divide it up into quarters. Just to give me a rough whereabouts I think I need to be. Then I'm going to get a little washer with a hole. And I can place this around... On the top like this till I can actually look and visualize that I have a really good match for it being center and leaving enough of the outside wall in all areas now that cross I drew was only an indication of where to start but as I move this actual washer around I can already see that it was inaccurate and I think that's exactly where I need to be. So I'm going to draw this circle of the internal part there. I'm just going to colour it in. Like this. I'll let you have a look. So as you can see, if I bring you over the top, I've pretty much got a central... A good set idea where the center of that is now if i bring this i can gauge where the center of that is bring it up 
and as this spins and goes down through the drill it should leave me just the right amount of room without taking out any of these walls that's a theory it's going to be a shame if we ruin it we've already put in an hour or so of, of work to get this far we don't want to ruin it now right i've got it in the drill and i'm going to drill i'm going to put it in the center and go down through i've marked my actual uh, drill bit with the depth I really believe I need to go or I want to go. And as you can see, when that becomes flush, the tape, with the level flush of this, I know I've achieved the maximum depth. But it's important now to go down through here, keeping this drill and drill bit level. Should I deviate, I could find myself destroying the wall. And as we've well, already said, that's the last thing we want. We've put in some time now to get this far. And slowly does it. And I'm looking to keep... I'm looking to keep the actual drill bit as level as I can. Right, I've got a fair bit of mess there. I'm going to clean up with a dustpan and brush. Then I'm going to actually look inside there and see if I'm happy I'm deep enough. So this is what we have after I've cleaned it all out. And I think you can see there right the way down through into um, this piece of wood. And it's gone down a fair way. It's gone down to roughly about that far in my finger. Which will be secure enough for me to put my wooden dowel and peg in um, and that's come out very well it hasn't broached any of the walls you can see there's a nice bit of wood around there that is solid that's not going to go anywhere so next step for me is to prepare the actual hazel shaft and shank to go into this so let's get on with that Right, I've got a piece of tracing paper and I've just put over it like that. And I'm going to draw that with the internal hole as well. I'll quickly show you. I'm just going around, just bear with me. Go around. There. And the idea behind this is I can move this around to get the best seating position on the end of the, the shaft of hazel that we're going to use. And it gives me the idea on how much wall is going to fit on the shaft. So there, I have a tracing of this here. And what I'll do is, I'll get my shaft here. And I'm going to place this over the top. And what I'm going to do is... As you can see, I'll move this around till I get the best seating position. And then I'll trace that circle over the top. So I'll just do that. Moving it around. And what I'm trying to do is get it so it's got the, the most amount of wood for the dowel. With not too much overhang of the, the walls of the actual wooden shaft because I will have to sand at some point and I think this will do it here just for me to do this just trace it there I'll just draw around it So 
So my shaft, that's going to be the top looking down onto my peg. Now I've got to work out how far down that I've got to put my marker. I'll show you. Right then, I need to gauge the depth of my dowel or plug. Um, so basically, all I'm going to do is get a pencil, push down, and I'll put a finger resting on the actual edge of my uh, Y piece here, which is going to butt against the shafts there. So basically, it's that length there. So basically, I'm going to bring it up to my shaft and then I'm going to make a mark in several places all the way around this shaft. I'll just do that. I'm trying to be as accurate as I can. There. And what I'm going to do now to aid me when I'm cutting, I'm going to get some tape. And this will give me a clear visible line of where I've actually got to actually start my cuts. So I'm putting it on there where I think. There. And the straighter you can get this line, the initial uh, cut line, the more accurate and less you'll have to play around trying to clean up the dowel surface afterwards. As you see, I'm doing a, my level best to keep everything as tight and square as possible. There, and take this down. So there, you can see I have a defined mark or a line, and that's going to be the depth of the plug. So if you imagine all the wood on the outside of that circle down to there, that's going to be my plug depth. So I'm now going to start cutting into this. So I have a coping saw here and I'm going to cut down just to start um, the process of giving me a good clear cutting line to create that dowel to the depth of this coping saw blade. And I'm going to follow the top line of that masking tape. So here we go. Like I said, it, the easier you make it for yourself by being clear and concise in the cuts the less work for yourself later on and I'm only going so deep as the blade and I'm following the masking tape all the way around what this will do is when I start whittling that dough out of this piece of hazel it will stop it's splintering into the shaft and breaking away. Allowing me to have a good, clear, crisp edge to the join. So I'm now going to create the dowel which will sit inside the actual socket that we've made on the Y piece. So I'm now going to get this hazel which you can see and I'm going to gradually take away that outside bit of that leaving the inner core of that circle down to the masking tape which we've cut that line all the way along I'm wearing gloves I've actually got my old overalls on top of my legs and um, we're going to crack on and do this now there Safety first, like gloves, and just be careful because one slip, not only could you damage your piece of work here, 
you could slice yourself. So I'll bring you back down to the work and you'll see what I'm doing. Right. Right. What I'm going to do is get this locked into my leg here a little bit here. And I'm going to start it off a little bit. You'll probably just see what's happening there now. I've got a very, very fine splinter just becoming to break away. And because we've created a line there, it won't split into the good wood. It will leave a good um, edge to make a good seal or a joint. I'm not hitting very hard. You can do this with your hand. But I find I get a little bit more control doing it this way. Yet again, as you can see, it's just holding there a little bit more. So I'll just do it by hand. There. And you can see again. And I'm going to repeat that all the way around. And then I'm going to, till, and then I'm going to keep working around till I get to that inner circle. And from there, we'll have to be very careful because we're looking to create a tight fit. But till we get to that point, I'm going to continue doing this. Right, um, you can see I've got the actual Y piece on the shank. And what I'm doing now is, I'll just take this off. It's quite a tight fit, actually. It's not too bad. It's quite what I'm looking for. I'm trying to get this to seat as flush as I can down on this. So I'm looking for high spots. So basically, I'm putting this on, moving it down through. And what I'm doing I'm holding it up to the light and what I'm doing is I'm looking for light along that joint. Now if I can see light, I actually have to mark where that is, take this off and on the opposite side, if I saw light on this side, I would take a few slithers off that shelf there to allow it to come down and sit back down on that piece of wood there more flush. It takes a lot of practice to get it to the point where, you know, it's a possibly a flush complete join all the way along where you do not distinguish um, that there is any kind of um, epoxy join. It takes a lot of practice and a lot of skill. Well, then, when you're happy with the seat as far as you want to go and, and remember this and I'll always say this if you're doing this for a first time or a second time or you don't feel too proficient. If you think you've got it halfway right, if you think that you're, you know, as close as you can get it, possibly leave it there because you do not want to go too far to where you ruin the work you've got. I've always said that. And I've said that to other people that are getting into this kind of craft and, and woodworking, that there's no shame in producing something that isn't a hundred percent, you know, spot on perfect, uh, because you're better off to have something where you can perhaps see a little bit of a join rather than ruin all this work for nothing. So it's a basically with with a lot of things regarding crafting and uh, woodwork. Once you feel you've gone to the edge of what where you can take it, know when to stop. There's been so many people that have got to something which is perfectly acceptable, but they've just gone that little bit too far over the edge, shall I say, and then they totally ruin their whole piece of work. Where beforehand, if they'd left it where it was it would have been okay and it would have been something they could have improved on on the next one but it's always knowing when to stop so with this one here i've marked so i know when i come to do the epoxy where the exact place i want these two to seat because if i don't i could be twisting off center and i could lose where i've actually married it all up 
and done my fine tuning of the wood to get it as good as I can get it. You can already see I would have to sand this back to marry it into the, sh the shaft and the shank. And that's no great um, you know, issue. It just means I will gradually just work all this till it all seats in flush with the wood of this particular hazel shaft. Well, your eyes aren't deceiving you. I'm on a push bike. I've had to cycle into a local town about four miles away. I've run out of epoxy. So yeah, never let it be said. Uh, there's no dedication with uh, folklore hiking sticks and the work we do. I'm having a cup of tea when I get back before I do anything else. Right then, I've taken the top off and I'm prepping it now to put, use the epoxy to actually bond it to the shaft. But there's several things I've got to do first. The first is I've scored two lines up through there. You might just see, uh, there they are two lines it, it might not come out on camera and what I'm doing I'm creating a channel to allow air and excess epoxy to be able to escape when I push the top on because if you don't you'll get dieseling or that similar type of effect where you can you can tr be pushing the actual um, head or topper onto the dowel but it won't go anywhere because you cannot compress the um, epoxy liquid or resin inside the chamber as you push down it needs somewhere to go so um, any excess can escape so I've scored it and all I'm doing now is creating that small little channel it doesn't have to be big but it does have to be able to allow any air and epoxy to actually escape. Um, I'm doing it with a sharp knife. Yet again, I'm I'm being careful not to cut myself um, because that would be unpleasant. Right, I think I've pretty much done that. It doesn't have to be deep. It doesn't have to be. But it has to be enough. I've done it before where I've had the epoxy when it's been a little bit cold in the workshop and it wouldn't flow out, out of here. And um, that subsequently meant it dieseled. So I had to take it off very quickly before the epoxy went off with the back end of a nail, scoop out some of it. But, you know, it's not ideal to be playing around with it. You want to get it right first time. Right. Let me just get this scored and I'll let you have a look. Right, I'll bring you into this. So there it is. I've actually got that channel, as you can see. It's not oversized. If you look down through, there's clearly a big enough channel for excess resin and air to escape. Basically, as you push down on the actual... Um, topper as it goes down through any build up on the top will make its way down this channel and squirt out over that lip and down here which now brings me on to the next topic which is we're going to completely cover this area with some protection for any excess resin that may get on my hands may spill out from here because quite simply if you can keep everything clean now it will save you a lot of hassle trying to clean this and the actual topper so I'm going to cover this protect it before we get any epoxy um, near it at all well I'm all prepped and I'm ready to do the epoxy this is always a little bit of a nervous time because you're under a little bit of time pressure and if you start having things go south um, it's very hard to rectify and on top of that, it's very, very hard to actually give yourself more time to actually fix the problem. So you want to 
get yourself fully set up, have all eventualities covered, and then calmly go into this particular phase. Right, I've got the actual shank there in an upright vertical position. It's clamped there, not too tight to damage the wood, but enough to allow me to work the actual um, stick. You can see the groove is facing out to me, so I can see what's going on. I've actually taped and used dog poo bags, incidentally, just to actually stop any resin coming down onto the bark, because um, I need to save that. Right then, I've got my two-part epoxy there. I've got some tape, which um, I will use to actually put pressure on once it's seated, pull it further down onto the shank. I've just got a spatula. I've got a nail which has got the end bit, which I can use to pack the um, two-part epoxy resin into the hole of the actual Y piece. Mixing container and a few other bits just to move the epoxy around. And somewhere I can put the stuff which gets covered with epoxy so I don't end up dropping it on the floor like I did that nail. And I can keep everything under control. I'm going to get uh, my wife Jamie to come in and film me while I do this because to try and do it on your own. That's the simple reason I failed to do this and why the other gentleman in one of my previous uh, videos said he would like to have seen this particular part. So I believe I'm all set up and I'm about to do this. Right, I've got my wife Jamie. She's going to be helping me do this by videoing it. Um, it's a one one shot hit. So if we film this and it messes up, um, there's nothing we can do about it. So we're going to give it our best shot. Isn't that right, Jamie? <laughs> it's all in your hands. Right then, I've got the epoxy. I'm going to break the seal. So well, as soon as I break the seal, that's it. We're well underway. So... Here goes nothing. That's it. Right, I've broke the seal. I need to keep that because I'm going to try and keep some of this resin back. Because traditionally I've been using all of it. And I don't think I need to. Right, as you can see I'm pushing it into the mixing bowl. I think that should be enough. I'm just going to let that sit there. Take some pressure off this actually. There. That's it. Right, let's work all this in. Now, with epoxy, if it gets too hot, it can spontaneously combust uh, resins. So you don't want it to get too hot. Right, I'm just mixing it up. Right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put some into the actual... into the hole and with the actual nail I'm just going to move it around in there I'm putting it out here onto the rim and I'm getting a good amount in there covering everything putting that down there so I don't make a mess now coming back up to the actual shaft, you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to pour the rest of it on the top like this and I'm going to bring it down over. I'm filling the channel on this side and I'm bringing it around to fill the actual lip. Right, get the last bits out. Now, yeah. bring it down there. It's a bit like icing a cake, just that you under a massive time pressure. Once it's gone off, there's nothing you can do. Right. Now, see if I can get the last bits out. That's not looking too bad. I've got some good even coverage there. Right. The last bits in here. Yeah. Right. 
just trying to get as much as I can. I'm very conscious of the time. There. So I'm going to get this one out now. <coughs> I can see there's plenty on there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm coming around here. And if you come around here, Jamie, you can see the lines. I'm going to push this one on. And you can hear the air bubbles coming out. You can see the bubble. That's coming out the channel. I'm just working it down. And I'm going to get scoop out the excess there so it doesn't make too big a mess. And that's what your air channel is doing. It's allowing everything to escape while you compress it down. Right. Now I'm pushing it right. I'm seating it. As you can see, it's beginning to come out there. I want to get those drips. There. I'm working my way around. And I've got to make sure those lines there are fully in line with each other. There. I can actually feel it getting a little bit warm now. So it's obviously starting to go off. So what have we got here? Just making sure that um, it's seated properly. And I haven't got too much coming down. Right. What I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to pull it down, as you can see, make sure it's fully seated so that the air inside, if any is still trapped, isn't gradually making it rise. I think it's okay at the moment. Jamie, if you move around there, I can make sure that we're fully seated. I'm a bit a bit. there and i think i'm pretty much done there so yeah my uh, assistant has now gone inside and i'm just actually cleaning up here i can feel the resin is warm in the mixing pot it's going off and it's not dripping anymore on the actual shaft which i've got obviously covered and protected so it's going off and within 30 minutes it's supposed to be um hard and within 24 hours fully cured but i've got a little bit of experience with resins and uh, i used to make surfboards many years ago and as a given rule you always give that perhaps double the time to what they actually say because it allows the resin to fully mature it may have gone off but resin um over a period of time after it's fully cured it will actually still harden off so um and you and you kind of let it to mature so i'm going to probably let this go for possibly two days i won't touch it the work's been done on the stick now so before i go sanding or doing anything um yeah, I'll just let it sit for two days. It's not hurting. And in the meantime, it's fully cooking off, going hard. It's maturing. So I'm not going to be putting any of the um, resin under any stress by me working it. So, yeah, I'm going to let that do its thing and to clean up here. Yeah, like I say, you know, you can see it's all going off there. It, it's it's pulling it's pulling away, but it is pretty much gone off and um you can just just feel a little bit of warmth to the container not much it's you know it's just, it is basically just going off and like you say that this this particular nail it's stuck there now you can see it's going off there so you can see that it's fully seated if I bring it back, there's not much wastage. It's come down to about here, some of the drips. And that's why you 
you know, get everything fully protected so you don't create more work for yourself. We're fully in line and it's not pushed up that seal. As you can see, it's it's pretty much pretty much well done. Well, I hope you enjoyed coming along with me while, um, you know, I was here doing this for a customer making a thumbstick. Now, I haven't and I won't show what I do afterwards because quite simply, I've got a, quite a few videos where it's self-explanatory. I'm just going to remove all the protective uh, wrapping on it and then I'm going to sand and blend it all in, which is basically sanding. And I think I have that pretty covered on some of my other videos. As I've said previously, that uh, this is the part I haven't been able to film when I've been on my own. Quite simply due to the fact of the mess that um, that can entail. And that went really smooth for me. I was actually quite nervous and paranoid that I'd have drips. It wouldn't go on. I'd have to take it off. I've had it hammering away trying to get it on. Um, I've had a, a quite a few disasters in the past. And I've been put under a lot of time pressure. But what happened there was smooth as silk so far as I'm concerned. It went on. Everything went right. Um, possibly because I was under a lot of pressure. I made sure I was doing things as they should be done. But it's worked out. And I hope you can see the process of like when you get your piece of wood, you shape it. You then get it prepped, get it ready. You get your stick ready. You get your dowel ready. And then you go into doing the two part epoxy. Afterwards, I mean, I could have actually, I could actually show you the complete finishing off this stick, but ultimately it would be down to your own preference in any case. But um, yeah, you've seen how to get the hard part done. So I hope that, um, you know, fills the gap that I might have in my previous videos. I feel it does. So, yeah, this is Andy from Folklore Hiking Sticks and the Folklore Workshop. I do have um, a couple other custom orders that I've already started as well, as long as doing this. And they're quite interesting. I'll document one of them because that is quite an unusual one, actually. But um, that's for another day. But uh, I will put some photographs of a sale that we um, went to where we took our load of stock to a shop in a nearby town of Tavistock, which is on the outskirts or in the foothills of uh, Dartmoor. So, um, yeah, I'll put those photos just as a look see so you can see uh, basically what we have on offer when we take away to um, other outlets that we sell from. So, yeah, this is Andy. Take care, stay safe. Hope to catch you guys on the trail.